Hello, everyone online. I'm Mike Moyer, and I'm the chairman of SAE Southern California Board. Um, so we'd like to welcome you tonight to our third SAE Southern California virtual meetup. Um, and as we all know, 2020 has become a pretty interesting year for all of us. Uh, but the SAE board has been working very hard to uh, uh, to bring online content so that it, we can get back to a somewhat normal life. Uh, so we're very excited about uh, uh, bringing these things to you, uh, which includes, of course, the Zoom meeting we're on today. And also, we've established a new YouTube channel, uh, which all of our meetings, including this one, are streaming live and will be available uh, at any time to see. So also, I'll give a quick uh, plug for the YouTube channel that once we hit 100 subscribers, then we get our own uh, uh, YouTube uh, um, SA SoCal um, uh, URL. So hit those subscribe buttons if you want. Uh, come join us for all of our events. Um, tonight, uh, I would like to introduce to you our new VC administrators, Mr. Delbert Boone. Um, with others on the board, Delbert has built an amazing team uh, that's uh, going to be bringing all of this stuff to us. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Delbert and uh, he can tell us a little bit about what's coming up in the near future. Okay, Delbert. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good evening, everyone. Again, as mentioned before, my name is Delbert Boone. I'm the newly nominated Meetings and Tours Vice Chairman, posed with the putting together the event calendar for the 2021 academic calendar year, which uh, goes from September to June of uh, next year. So just to inform everyone of some upcoming events, uh, September 30th, we'll have a virtual webinar for uh, electric vehicles as part of National Electric Drive Week. And that will be starting at 6 p.m. And then Oct October 7th, we're looking at having a career seminar in conjunction with SHIP, uh, Nesby and the Society of Women Engineers. Um, and then if you want additional information, uh, we can drive traffic through our website at saesocal.org, or if you can follow us, uh, we'll give information towards the end of the webinar on our Facebook and other social media platforms in which you can gather more information on our upcoming calendar for the academic year. Um, without further ado, I'll now pass it to my colleague, Dean Case, uh, who will introduce our guest speaker. Uh, thank you, Delbert. Uh, this is kind of a real honor for me to introduce this. Uh, we get a little feedback here. Okay, I guess we're okay. We're still learning this, but uh, for me, this is a real treat to get to introduce Pete Lyons uh, for this talk. Uh, if you grew up in the '70s or were a fan of Formula One, there was no internet, there was no ESPN, there was no uh, Fox Sports, there was none of that. So if you wanted to follow Formula One, you plunk down hard money to get uh -huh. auto sport. And this is what you'd get. And so I first got to know Pete as a byline. And Pete wrote the best Formula One stories you could ever find. If you're lucky, the LA Times might have a little box score. It told you who won. But you'd wait, depending on if you were like me, cheap and getting it via C-mail, like three or four weeks later, you'd find out all the details. And these are fabulous reports. And more recently, I've got to know Pete as a professional colleague. And I have most of his books in my collection and I highly recommend them. So when he said he was gonna do a book on the shadow, I thought, wow, this would be a great topic for SAE, just from the standpoint of fascinating cars. But unlike a lot of people who write historical books where they have to research who did what, Pete was there. And so I think he had a, the unfair advantage for him was he didn't have to research who designed these shadow cars. He knew them personally back in the day. And so I think, you know, again, some stories that are behind the scenes, but um, for those of you who don't know Can-Am, uh, this was a wild series. It was faster than Formula One, paid better than Formula One, and the schedule was such that a lot of the F1 drivers would do come race in the US and Canada on their off weekends. And Pete was there during this amazing heyday. And the cars, this was the early days of aerodynamics, so unbelievable innovation and innovation you could see, not hidden beneath the skin like a lot of modern Formula One cars. So uh, I'd like to turn it over, have Pete uh, share his screen and walk us through. And if you like, post some questions down at the bottom. Uh, we're asking Pete to walk through uh, kind of a short slide deck 
and then we'll have Q&A, which can delve into other cars or even other Can-Am topics, if you will. Uh, but the focus, as Pete's going to talk about, was the original mind-blowing Shadow Can-Am car. So uh, take it away, Pete. Well, thank you, Dean. You are my new marketing manager. Good job. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right about the Can-Am. It was so exciting, and I was incredibly lucky to be there at the right time. Um, Everybody remembers the Can-Am as being unlimited, no rules at all. There were, in fact, a couple of rules. The car had to look like a sports car, which means it had to have its wheels covered and there had to be room for a passenger, not necessarily a seat, but at least if you were small and, and silly, you could sit into it, get into it like I did a couple of glorious times. But the uh, it was an era before anybody had real access to computers. Some of, you know, Ford Motor Company, GM, some of the aerospace companies had computers and they could do some simulations using IBM punch cards and so on. But um, if you had a wild, crazy idea for a new Can-Am car and it was allowed, you could do almost anything with the aerodynamics or the weight or the engine or the suspension, the driveline, anything. You had to actually cut material and build the car and take it out of the test track and try it and see if it worked. It, none of the scurrying around inside a computer with nobody watching. And so that's what made the Can-Am so incredibly exciting. The racing might not have been all that good, although sometimes it was, but the cars were just fantastic. And the first uh, shadow was exactly in that vein. It was wild hair experimentation. Uh, a guy named Trevor Harris, who is the, the little helmet you can see sticking out of this mock-up shadow, uh, got together with this tall guy standing next to it, who's Don Nichols, and they wanted to create a car with far less frontal area than any other. The idea being they would whistle along the straights like a missile, and Trevor hoped also that the way he built the car, it would go, get through the corners as well, so they'd end up dominating the Can-Am and becoming world famous. Uh, didn't quite work out that way, although there were reasons for that. This is a done. This, the previous photo was uh, on the cover of Road and Track was done by uh, on a photo shoot outside their shops. This is before the car was actually built. So what we're looking at here is actually the fiberglass body buck, the the mold over which the molds were taken to make the fiberglass shell. And so they painted it up in black. I guess it was because it, they happened to have a can of black. And uh, Trevor sat in what was a wooden mock-up of the, of the car. They perched the uh, single row streamlined induction system on the top. It's just sitting there. It would tip over if somebody pushed it. And the wheels are made out of cardboard. But it looks like the real shadow, which then it appear later on. Uh, and I'll, uh, I've got a shot of it taken when it appeared about a year later racing in a different color. Um, this is how design was done in those days. Here's Trevor Harris at his desk or his drawing board, and there's Don watching him. And we'll talk in more detail about what Trevor's holding. It basically is a pod of three little suspension springs because the car was so minute. Uh, it had the, the decision to make tiny tires had carry on consequences throughout the rest of the car. And one of them was that there was no room for anything that was conventional. So he had to produce design and make and test every single other system in the car, including the suspension. But this was the basic concept that they wanted to do. I'm trying to change number, yeah, here it is. This is uh, one of the auxiliary drawings that was on the cover of Road and Track done by John Thompson. And the red outline, of course, is the basic concept for the shadow. Uh, and the yellow outline, which I'll, you'll see in a moment, is the uh, uh, a, a contemporary McLaren. If you can see the yellow outline, it shows the top line of the body of the McLaren, which is considerably taller than that. Um, while we're here, before I, well, here, here's the comparison I did of the uh, frontal drawing that uh, Road and Track did, and I created a, a shadow of the uh, other car behind it. So you can see the dramatic difference in the frontal area. Uh, if you go back to here, the, uh, the fact that the car was so low, there was no room in the front for a radiator. And because uh, there was no room for fuel tanks in the middle of the car, only here either side of the engine, where do you put the radiators? So Trevor's only 
solution that he could that he could accept would be put them behind the rear wheels. So that's what's going out and back in the back of this car here. It's basically a system of scoops which uh, direct air in laterally to a pair of Corvette radiators sitting in the tail. We've got more photographs of that. And you notice they streamline the, uh, the original body by putting spats over the wheels like a, like a classic uh, 1930s car. So there's, there's the uh, frontal area of it again. And the, 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 uh, what you see either side here, you can see the McLaren behind it. Uh, this is, these are the scoops that would bring air in to the uh, lateral, in, bring air into the radiators. <clears throat> I don't do public speaking, guys, sorry. I'll, I'll fix it all in the rewrite. Uh, this is the very first mock-up that Trevor Harris did to show his new partner, Don Nichols, what he was talking about. He simply put a Chevy engine on the floor, which you can just barely see behind him. Then he quickly knocked up a, a plywood frame and made some of these cardboard wheels and put them in place. And where do you put the radiator? Well, in that, in, hit, in this place, in this stage, before he thought about the fuel tanks, he put the fuel, uh, radiator right in front of the uh, back wheel, which it, it's a commonplace thing nowadays. But the uh, end result is he didn't have uh, space to do that in the real car. Um, here's, this is a shot of the resulting hardware that he was building. Now, this photograph was taken only a few years ago, 40 odd years after uh, Don Nichols and Trevor Harris first worked together. This is a surviving original monocoque chassis, which Don Nichols had in his very famous wizard's lair up in Salinas, California, a cavernous old steel shed of a place, a warehouse where he just would not throw anything away. He kept everything he possibly could, including this original chassis, this original front suspension assembly, which had to be extremely compact because of the very small 10 inch diameter front uh, tires, wheels rather, tires were slightly bigger. They had to be specially made by Firestone. Uh, because the brakes had to be cut down so much to fit inside this tiny wheel, uh, Trevor, uh, uh, he didn't invent this. He saw it on other people, but they used a, a cut down Corvair engine cooling fan which they attached to the outside of the wheels to help extract air from out here. Uh, and you know, all this, also sitting on top of the tub here is a, a really minute steering wheel, which was, uh, they, they wanted to put that in the car to keep the, the space down. Um, this is a document that uh, Firestone prepared to commemorate the fact that in December of 1968, they had agreed with the Don Nichols of Nichols Advanced Vehicles Systems that uh, they would do uh, tires, experimental tires to suit this car. And these were the original target specifications. Uh, I don't know if anybody uh, can read all this or if they want to know the details, but for the front, something called the tread arc, which I understand is the basically the width of the tread on the road is 11 inches outside diameter of the wheel of the tire 15 inches on the um, 10 inch rim. Uh, and section is 12.5, uh, I guess. You know, you guys probably know more about what section is, so I'll move on. And here's the wheel itself is eight inches wide by 10 inches diameter. In, in fact, they never quite made these targets. They found it enormously difficult to make the uh, tires work because the, the, again, this is in the 2012 visit uh, between Don and Trevor. Trevor is right, reminding Don how difficult it was in the early tires to get a flat fire, tire profile. Uh, you can see that the tire without any air in it at all is very pronouncedly concave. And even when they put air into it, it, was, um, it would uh, still not put the, all the rubber on the road. This is Don sitting in a finished car with one of the first sets of tires. And you can see the dually pickup truck appearance where the middle of the tread is just not picking up any floor dust whatsoever. Uh, this is an example. This is a shot taken in period in the factory in Santa Ana, California, where they are actually making the wheels. The, this, this upper larger one is a rear wheel assembly. It's a 12 inch diameter, but something like 17 inches wide. And they did it by taking a couple of spun aluminum dishes and putting them together end to end so that the uh, tires could go, the tires would go about this big around them. Uh, the front wheel was similar. There was a similar spun disc, a similar, similar spun 
teacup on the front, but the outside part of it was a machined aluminum thing so that it could take the fixing bolts for the wheels and also the uh, brake cooling fan. Um, again, this is the uh, car. I'm moving down through my slides here. This is uh, the same occasion you saw a moment ago with Don Nichols proving that the car really was knee high. Like he used to call it the knee high car. And because he was six foot four, former paratrooper with the army, he, um, he had fairly long legs and the car definitely was going to be exactly the height of his knees. And to get that though, Trevor Harris decided that he would drive it like a go-kart laying back on his back, like an endurance cart. And, uh, and you can also see there's hardly any room for his feet in here. The car is so tiny. Um, this is what happened to the, uh, the, the uh, this is what his, this is the foot space here. And the, I'll show you a different view of it in a moment. These are the only two foot pedals he can put into it. There's only room for two, a gas and a brake. And so that caused a problem. What do you do about a clutch pedal? We'll come to that in a moment. Also notice here's the very tiny steering wheel sitting down and Trevor decided that <coughs> because it was so low, he needed it to be nearly horizontal, something like a bus thing. So he made a, uh, you know, a, a complicated uh, universal joint system with a little tiny flat tire on it, flat steering wheel on it. This is another view of it. And I put in the uh, legend to show you, here's the brake pedal over here throttle pedal over here. And you notice that they're both on vertical pivots. So that the driver sat in there with his feet splayed out widely uh, with his toe over here on the right and his other toe over here on the left and the heels probably touching each other in the middle. Possibly the craziest car you can imagine. And you look how far forward of the front wheels his feet would have been. Anybody have any questions? Can anybody hear me? Hello? Okay, I'll keep going as though we're talking. We, we can hear you, we can hear you just fine. We're just, oh, yeah, thank I you. I think everybody's Good. in awe of the pictures. Okay, yeah. I appreciate that, thank you. No, I thought, thought suddenly, have I done something wrong and I've been talking into the empty space? Excuse me, guys. Yeah, no, you're good. But we are okay. encouraging the audience if they want to post questions uh, sure. during the presentation, we'll field them. Sure. Thank you for holding my hands, fellas. This is tr intrepid George Fulmer, who was the first professional driver to uh, actually race the car. He's in the original prototype. This was shot out at Riverside in the uh, late in the 1969, I think. <clears throat> uh, you can see he's sitting reclined in the original low seat with his feet stuck out into the footwell. This is the nearly horizontal steering wheel and the uh, Please don't pay too much attention to where his, it comes in relation to his uh, man parts, as the English would say. And we talked about the clutch. Well, right here is obviously the gear shift. Isn't that right? The left-hand gear shift? Well, no, actually, no. The gear shift is over here on the right. So this is the clutch linkage. The, the lever operates a hydraulic system, which goes around the, around the car into the uh, clutch so that but the fact is that George only needed the clutch to get the car going out of the pits. Uh, once he was uh, on at speed on the track, he could change gear without using the clutch on a Hewland transmission. He was used to doing that. They modified the transmission to make it easier, but almost anybody can do it anyway. On my one or two occasions of trying a Can-Am car, I kind of surreptitiously tried it. And lo and behold, you can do it. You probably don't want to do it in, in when the uh, chief mechanic is in earshot though. This car proved to be almost impossible to drive and they spent a long time, almost a year developing it. This is a picture taken in 1970 at Mossport where George Fulmer drove the car for the first time in public at, at a race. Uh, you notice they've sat him up further. They've given him a conventional steering wheel although they didn't actually solve the, uh, the problem uh, involving this area. This is still the clutch lever. Here's the uh, gear shift lever over here. And this is what the car looked like probably that same day or a similar day. I'm sorry, an earlier day out at uh, Riverside in testing. This is when it was still the long, low lean profile with the wheel spats in place and the, um, the uh, shroud that, or the, the 
the ducting that brought the air into the uh, radiators at the rear. You'll notice that the, it's got a dollar sign on it because uh, it was kind of a joke. When uh, Trevor Harris originally outlined his plan to Don Nichols about the car, Don got all excited but says, well, Trevor, how, how much is that going to cost? Trevor says, oh, I think it can be done for, oh, 40 or $50,000. That was this stage. But we got to this stage and Don Nichols had spent way more than that. And so rather than start to grouse and shut down the budget and make him stop doing this, he just called it the dollar car and carried on. He, it was humorous to him. He'd made a lot of money in, in the business, parts business, the tire business and so on in Japan for several years. So he had quite a lot of money at that stage, but uh, he did not end the program with a lot of money. Um, this Again, I've showed you this earlier. This is what the car looked like at speed at Riverside. The, the, uh, another thing to notice is that the original idea of a very narrow profile snorkel intake had to be abandoned. They just weren't getting the horsepower out of it. So they eventually adopted the regular stack of the eight intake stacks that uh, conventional cars were using in the day. This is a rear view of the car. Uh, you can see the four conventional intake stacks here. This is Fulmer's head sitting here. Over here is Trevor Harris uh, talking to him. Um, this is the one of the guys that built it, Walt Boyd. And Walt was actually the very first guy to ever drive the car. He had a sprint car and midget racing background back east. So when they had the car ready, somebody said, well, we got to try it. So somebody said, Walt's the only guy who's ever driven a race car. Get in it. So Walt drove it in the main street, the, this, this, the street outside the shop in Santa Ana. And he, uh, he practically got a wheelie and he locked up the brakes and nearly spun off into a parking. He did spin off into a parking lot, but luckily everybody had gone home early that day. But it was pretty hairy in those days. Again, no computer simulations. Uh, the guy here with his trademark black hat, perhaps some of you who would recognize him, his name is Jim Meterer. And right after this project in 69 and 70, he went off separately and he uh, formed a company called Racing Beat, which became very famous for its high quality Mazda aftermarket parts, particularly with the early rotary engines, and then later on with the Miatas. But uh, a lot, even people at uh, Racing Beat never knew that Jim Meterer, their founder, was involved with the original Shadow. Some guy who didn't want to get involved with the original shadows over here in the brown shirt, that's Lothar Mochenbacher, one of the uh, one of the good racing drivers of that day, who this day at Riverside, I think he'd been testing this Formula 5000 car up here. But at the end of the day, obviously he put got back into civvies and came down to see what this crazy contraption was. Uh, the, the car originally had no rear spoilers at all. Uh, we'll get to a reason why Trevor thought he could get away with that, but uh, the, there was a rules change which made it impossible for him to do what he intended to do originally. So as a stopgap to keep the rear end nailed down, they started playing with different tail spoilers. There's a couple of aluminum uh, uh, ducktails, I guess you'd call them, sitting here. And that did help, but it wasn't enough. Another problem was the cooling. Is somebody saying something? Yeah, Pete, uh, question popped in. What was the weight of the original car there? You know? um, I've tried hard to find out, and Trevor says, yeah, I think we did weigh it, but I have no idea what it is, and I've never found any paperwork. Uh, he, he, in the video that uh, he and Don shot during that 2012 visit, uh, they were joking about how heavy the pieces were that they were picking up and carrying, moving around. He says, this thing was not as light as we said it was. So I imagine, you know, they didn't seem to worry about putting stuff in it and they could only afford an iron block for a Chevy engine. They could not put a aluminum block in it. So the thing obviously was pretty heavy. Um, the the ductwork here is uh, how the air was going to go into the radiators. Uh, it's hard to see it here, but we'll have better pictures. In, in the exit of the duct here, there is an articulated vein, a flap on a vertical axis, exactly like a giant uh, butterfly valve. And the idea was that the driver could control it. He could either close it and all the air would go into the uh, uh, radiators and then get exhausted both 
up through the top. There's a big wide slot across the back of here. That would help create downforce, they thought. But when they couldn't uh, get the car to cool adequately, they pierced these extra holes in the back. You see a, an oil cooler sitting over here, and I don't know what's inside here, but basically this is helped to, to help get air out. Um, normally, Trevor said they would figure that the engine was getting enough cooling air anyway, so that they would open these veins and the air that was going through would fill in the space in behind the blunt back of the car, filling it in so that it would reduce drag further and, and in further increased speed. Um, all that went away over the period of uh, the next year. One of the reasons was that uh, after Trevor designed the car and locked in the design of his car, he was no longer allowed to have any moving aerodynamic devices. So that not only eliminated the brake cooling, I'm sorry, the, the cooling vent, the articulated cooling vents, the throttle bodies that he had intended to, it also eliminated what he had planned to do for downforce, which was a set of uh, air brakes. The car would have a big air brake across the back and then a pair of them up front and right in front of the wheels where Jim Meter's hand is. There's there'll be a second one and then a third one over here that on, you know, probably when they pushed on the brake pedal, all three of those would go up and help retard the car, get, help those tiny brakes out. Uh, Trevor calculated that if his car could reach the 250 miles per hour straightaway speed that he predicted it would, that the added air drag alone, when he deployed the air brakes, it would stop the car down, to, it would slow the car down to 200 without any intervention from the brakes. The, the brakes would be spared until it got to a, down to a normal car speed, uh, but they never actually got to do that. Uh, later on in the presentation, I'll show you um, a representation of the air brakes, but uh, we don't have, in, in period, they were never finished and done, but they have been built since. Uh, when the car finally appeared, and this is the first time I ever saw it, this is the pit line at Mossport in June 1970. And I had, I, know the, I had known the car was there, and here it appeared around the corner of the pit line being pushed in. Um, this is Don Nichols pushing it. He's 6'4". Here's Trevor Harris. He's you know, a man of normal stature. Uh, this, I think, is a Firestone engineer. And this is their Japanese mechanic, Teji, who was driving it. Uh, the car, look how low the car is in relation to the Ford van next to it. Uh, here, here is the wheel arch of the Ford van, and it's, 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 it's above Teji's head here in the, in the cockpit. So this car was really low. This angle also shows you the air, the Corvair fans on the outside of the front uh, wheels. Um, this is uh, one of the fan, in order to change the wheels, which were bolt on, I think there were five bolts. You first had to remove the bolts that held on the cooling fan. Then you had to take out, take off the tires put, and then reassemble the whole thing. So it was by no means a quick change thing. So. The fact that the fuel tanks were all back here and were not really enough to do a 200 mile Can-Am race meant that in order, if they were ever able to finish a Can-Am race, they'd have to do it by refueling and probably changing tires at that point. So as Trevor has admitted in later years, there was no way this car would be competitive. Um, here is the uh, brake assembly as it originally appeared at Mossport that year. This is a Hurst Earhart caliper, and this is a Hurst Earhart disc. Now, normally this disc was supplied 15 inches in diameter, and the brake caliper was made to suit so that uh, anybody who wanted to do anything crazy with a braking system had, had the basic hardware from Hurst Earhart to do it. But what Trevor had to do is to take, he had to trim down the 15 inch disc to eight inches to fit inside its tire his wheel. So that drastically decreased the surface area of the disc. And of course, the, the ends of the caliper had to be trimmed too to fit inside. That didn't hurt that they were able to re-engineer it and weld it and machine it and so on so that it didn't interfere with the functioning of the disc of the caliper. But it, it did obviously didn't do anything to give the uh, poor brake disc any more uh, radiant heat area. So cooling was a serious issue. 
Also, we see here the very compact front suspension and I'll, I'll uh, circle here the one of the three little springs that were used to fit the space available for this tiny tire car. When the car got out on the track, this it was just amazing. Uh, nobody had ever seen anything quite as wild and crazy as this. Even the chaparrales looked rational in uh, comparison to this. It's, uh, people were all talking about go-karts and steroids. Uh, one of the ones I liked a lot was that people said it looks like a skateboard with a Chevy strapped on the back. Uh, because they did go away from the original idea of very super streamlined uh, air induction system. They needed more horsepower, so they just said the heck with it, and they put it on a conventional big intake st stacks. Also, there was a they, they couldn't get the rear brakes to cool properly with the original plan, so they put in these two little cannons here, which actually are simply scoops to bring air down to the inboard rear brakes. Also, originally the exhaust headers went down out the back of the car below. But again, they weren't getting enough horsepower, so they just said the heck with it, and they put good conventional headers. And then the uh, because the cooling was so marginal, they just could not get the rear radiators to cool. As Trevor says, uh, uh, all I can say is never, my advice to any other designer is never to put your radiators behind your wheels. That's all I've got to say. And so, the only other place was somewhere up in the airstream, and he didn't want to add more drag down here, like perching them on top of the rear fender, which would, you know, you and I would probably think is logical. So instead, he put them on top of the rear wing. This horizontally here across the back, which looks like a gigantic, grotesque gurney flap, is uh, a pair of a, a pair of radiators which have been trimmed down, laying it on their sides so that they would fit here. And I think there's oil coolers in here too. And Trevor said that in fact, they not only cooled the engine, they did a pretty good job of cooling the engine. He says they also did in fact work like a porous gurney flap and they helped downforce. And he said, this was actually a pretty good uh, deal. It, 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 it made the car, the car was not a good car. It didn't handle well, it didn't hold the road well, but at least he had aerodynamic balance on it finally. The, uh, and here's what it looked like from the side. This is the far end of the uh, racetrack at uh, Moss Sport. It's down at the corner they call Moss Hairpin, which is at the bottom of a, of a little valley. And uh, George is hurling the thing around the apex of the turn at something like 50 miles an hour. And ahead of him is a rising kind of sinuous, but flat out rising straight away. Uh, it's, I, I would say it's upwards of a mile long. Have, it's probably a kilometer long anyway. And he said that by the end of that, rise up that hill, he was going 196 miles an hour. There's, there was lap, there was timing that could uh, um, confirm that. And that compared to the fastest conventional car like a McLaren of the day was less than 180. Even with all this added drag, the low body profile gave the car that much extra speed. The problem, of course, is you get to the end of the straightaway and then you've got the car, the car has to do certain other things like slow down and go around the corner. So that was their problem. They did, however, qualify sixth fastest, uh, which was not actually bad. The, they were three seconds a lap slower than the fastest cars, but a lot faster than more conventional cars driven by um, you know, normal you know, clubman type teams. Uh, and here is the a rear view of the same location of the track. I hope it will come up. Come on, girl. Come on. We're all waiting. It's a it's a rear view showing the the back of the car and what that looked like. Again, you see they, they to, because of all the tire change problems that you know not only did they have the bolting bolt stone do they took they had to un, they had to take the spat off the back of the car to get at the wheel. So there came a day when they just left it off and never put it back on again. <clears throat> you can see the radiators that used to be here are now gone. The back of the engine and gearbox are exposed. There's a couple of struts that hold the wing up. And the uh, basically the airflow under the wing is greatly compromised by the bulk of the engine induction and exhaust system, but it worked. Uh, what didn't work is the radiators on top of the wing. In fact, they did work, but 
There was a new rule in the formerly free Can-Am. In 1970, for reasons best known to the French, something called moving, aer moving aerodynamics were banned. It was a reaction to the Lotuses having copied Chaparral, but not having copied it properly. And in 1969, Lotus had some nasty wing failures causing you know, nasty accidents because they weren't strong enough. And so the knee-jerk reaction of the French governing body, the FIA, was to ban wings. And they did it by banning moving aerodynamic devices. So you could no longer mount your wing on the rear suspension like Chaparral pioneered. But instead, the car had to be the wing had to be on the car and fairly low down. There were certain height limits regulating the height of the wing, and one of them fouled this car. This uh, the, the, there was something that governed the forward-facing air gap. Now the back, the bottom of this Mossport car's wing is within the height limit of the forward-facing air gap, so that air, under this under the wing of being the forward facing air gap. However, they said, you know, air goes through this radiator matrix. That means it's an air gap. We can't allow you to have the radiators on top of your wing. <clears throat> Don't you love rules and regulations? That's why I love the Can-Am so much. So for the second week, two weeks later, second race, Trevor Harris to, had to re-engineer his entire wing system. He had already anticipated this problem and built this new wing, but he'd never mounted and plumbed it and tested it. So in the two weeks between races in Canada, while they were on the road working on borrowed premises with no race shop, uh, racing hardware shops available, he had to go into a hardware store and buy ordinary plumbing and cobble something together. He said it was the worst plumbing job of my life. But he put the radiators inside this wing. It's actually a dual surface wing, like a sandwich and the radiators are inside it. And the air inlet comes through. There's, there's been aircraft with this kind of leading edge uh, induction system. Uh, you know, Messerschmitt's had it. I think Spitfire's had something like it. <clears throat> and Trevor says, this actually worked really well. Uh, you notice it also had to be lower than the previous wing was. And so it, it, underneath the wing, the space was still constricted, but he still feels the wing worked pretty well. However, the car overheated terribly there at Mossport, I'm sorry, at saint Juvit in Quebec. And Trevor says the reason was they had were already on their third engine, which was already tired, and they were out of money. They couldn't fix the, the one remaining running engine they had. They didn't have enough money to get a new one. And so they, ran, they started the race on seven cylinders on a stick engine, and it was overheating from the get-go. It only got like uh, roughly 15 laps into the race before it, it just pegged and he had to quit. Uh, this was the end result of the car's racing career in its first iteration, the second race in 1970. <clears throat> uh, on the way home from the racetrack on Monday morning, this car was in its trailer. We don't have a photograph of it here. It's in the book. But um, a drunk driver driving a stolen car in the rain crossed this median on the, on the expressway and slammed into the shadow trailer and badly damaged this car, knocking it out of action. So that chassis from that car is the one you saw earlier in Don's shop 45 years later. They had a second car a chassis, which they were able to repair. And Don Nichols won a lawsuit in England and he was able to cobble together a second car and they took it to mid Ohio. Uh, Trevor Harris had left the team by then. And so Jim Meterer was promoted to crew chief and he wanted his name on the side of the car that says Jim Meterer here. Uh, they brought in, uh, they asked George Fulmer to come back and try it and he tried it and he said, you know, um, <coughs> I've got a lot of good rides going elsewhere. Uh, I don't really have time for those fellows, but I know a guy who would love to drive it. My friend, Vic Elford, who is here. And this is quick Vic Elford, who was interested in moving from the rally world into the racing world. And so he agreed to give it a go for at, uh, at mid Ohio. So this is Vic about to drive this car. And I chose this picture for the book because it looks to me like he's having some misgivings. What have I agreed to? Uh, he really had no better a weekend than um, Jim, then I'm sorry, than George Fulmer had had. 
this is what the car looked like temporarily during its you know few laps of life at uh, Mid Ohio. Uh, this is Tony Dean in his Porsche 908 three liter car. You see the the normal conventional Le Mans car was a very super sleek streamlined thing, sort of what Trevor Harris was trying to go for a couple of years earlier, but uh, you know modern and and on proper tires and with suitable aerodynamics. Uh, this is the what had become of the super streamlined shadow missile. It, what had been the lowest drag Can-Am car ever designed had suddenly turned overnight into probably the worst drag Can-Am car ever designed. I'm going to take a break here, guys. Uh, may I ask you to talk amongst yourselves while I take a break? I've come over here without a, a bottle of water. I'm going to go get one. Is that all right? This is your next slide. I'll be right back. Chime in here a little bit, but we know we got quite a few. Uh, we've advertised this beyond just our traditional SAE members. So if you have an interest in this, I would encourage you to go to SAE.org and consider joining. So you'll get first uh, hand information on this. And looking at our list of participants uh, or the uh, viewers on this, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call out, I see Neil Hanneman is watching. So, hey, Neil, if you'd like to give a presentation on some future one, uh, you don't even have to travel down to Southern California. We can do it remotely. Uh, we'd love to hear some of your uh, motorsport stories. So, and Delbert will cover this at the end. This is all volunteer done. Your SA SoCal board, uh, Mike Moyer, myself, Delbert, TJ, we're all volunteers. So if you'd like to get involved with this and help out and plan uh, cool events, we welcome you to join us. This is for me, it was an excuse to call up my friend Pete Lyons and say, hey, let's talk about uh, race cars. And uh, so. Okay, dim the house lights if you care to. Pete is back. Okay. Intermission's over. Intermission's over. Back to you, right. Pete. Right. Thank you, guys. Um, this is, I think, it, I'm not sure, but I think it's the chassis we saw under the orange car and the one that was on the table in Don Nichols' shop. This is uh, when it was undergoing restoration uh, in the same general area at, at about a couple of years later. Excuse me. I chose this picture because uh, if you clean up all the shop garbage in the background and just isolate on the car, which I was able to do, I love Photoshop. This is a good schematic impression of what the car looked like. Here is the very shallow cockpit and it had to be that shallow with very narrow, very shallow sills here. These sills on the side are only four inches deep because the, those rules in the Can-Am, the very few rules, they always required you to have a door because it was a sports car club of America series. Sports cars have doors as well as two seats. Our Can-Am cars have to have doors so we can tell people that they're sports cars. And so that meant, they meant there was a certain area here of unobstructed space that uh, the car had to have. Conventional cars, no problem. They had like 14 inches of, of uh, space for a, a monocoque chassis here, but Trevor Harris only had four inches to work with. He ended up having to put diagonal struts in place, which we'll show you presently, I think. Uh, that's why all the fuel had to be back here. It had to be either side of the big Chevy engine. And there were 25 gallons a side, so a total of 50. But the uh, typical McLarens of the day were, you know, 75 gallons of fuel to go the 200 mile Can-Am race. So that uh, compromised the design right there. Right behind here in the empty space is a module which will contain the rear suspension. This is being one of the suspension pieces that Trevor had designed sitting out here on the ground. Uh, and here is one of the modules, one of, one of the two modules at the back, which contain the Corvette radiator. It was a it sit diagonally so that it would help, you know, it be more conducive to the flow from the outside laterally than expel out to the rear. Right here at the back is an oil tank. Um, you may think, gosh, this car is pretty tail heavy. And it was. Uh, again, Trevor says we never, he, if they ever weighed it, he doesn't have the numbers anymore. But it was legitimately with full fuel, ready to go, body work on it it was about 75% on the rear wheels. Do the math, that's 25% on the rear. And yes, drivers did talk about wheelies. Uh, one, another, this uh, 
in this view, we can see those two struts that Trevor engineered into the car to help brace it in beam strength. He, uh, the, the, uh, the, the door opening had to be unobstructed so the driver could get out. Never mind, they never bothered with the doors, they just stepped over them. But the rules said it had to be here and it had to be openable. So he uh, made, uh, I guess you could call it on the rifle bolt system. It was, you could rotate these, um, rods 90 degrees and the thread ends at, at, at the end were machined out a quarter two quarters were taken out of them so all you had to do was rotate at 90 degrees and the thing would just slip out of space out of place which i thought was clever but they never actually used it but it, it made the car legal and it also added to the beam strength um in front here um first of all this picture shows this is a modern reproduction of concept. Uh, it's, it's realization of concept. It's not a strict restoration. This one has had has Trevor's air brakes installed and they will function. We'll have other pictures of it. This orange thing back here is a modern completion of the original concept that Trevor Harris did. They consulted with Trevor and he, he helped them design all this to, and build it in Michigan. Um, this, this one would rise up into the air and up here in front in these two vertical boxes are a couple of smaller ones which will rise up. Up front here is an original piece that Trevor put in. It's an auxiliary piece at the front, a kind of a wedge shaped thing. And it's mainly designed to, to hold the bodywork there. There's nothing else inside it. But what is really kind of clever is that rather cunningly, the, ins, this, this, the bottom level of the bottom surface of it is not parallel to the ground. It's actually pitched forward and back a bit with a, about a five degree lift from front to rear. It's actually a Venturi. It's kind of a crude Venturi. So this is one of the things Trevor was thinking about uh, you know, producing ground effects by way of a Venturi. And also another thing you can see, if in, not only in other pictures, but in this one, you see this side sill along here. It, it, can, it continued a sill, a lip spoiler, it went around the tail, the nose of the car this way and all the way back. And in fact, for looks purposes, he continued it around the tail of the car. Um, Trevor believes he's the first guy to invent a side lip on a car. And it was designed to help uh, that's the same problem that other, other cars were having of lifting. You know, if the car got cockeyed to the wind, uh, air could get underneath it and lift the car. And this car was arrowhead shaped so that you know, the front was narrower than the back. And he said, you know, we're gonna get situations where we got air coming in from the side. So I'm gonna continue the front end lip around the side to prevent that happening. And they never in fact did get any lifting from the side, but mind you, they never had much of a racing career either. Uh, <clears throat> and somewhat earlier before the show started, we were talking about uh, blowovers, a car at Elkhart Lake uh, just this last year, just this last month, uh, flipped over backwards, the standard Can-Am blowover uh, caused by air getting underneath the front and the car just lifted up, go, went over backward like a speedboat. Uh, that happens a lot with these cars because they're designed for downforce, but if they lose the front end downforce, guess what? It turns into upforce. Uh, we'll get into that again later. If anybody wants to stay with me long, I can keep talking as long as my water holds up. Um, Shock absorbers, very tiny shock absorbers. There's no room for hydraulics. In point of fact, more modern technology can do hydraulics. They've done it on the modern cars, but this is what Trevor's original plan was, a friction shock. I hear a question. Did somebody want to ask something? Uh, actually, there's a couple of questions that we can hold those till you get to the end. There was one related to the suspension springs back on slide 22, so I don't know if Okay, that's, that's coming up. It's uh, two more slides from now, I'll, I'll come okay. back to it. Um, the, um, any of you who are old enough or uh, are a fan of vintage cars of the 20s and 30s will know what a friction shock is. Basically, it's a sandwich of, of friction material with steel plates. And as the suspension works, the, there's friction between all the moving elements and you tighten this nut here to slacken it off or make it tighter. It's a incredibly crude. It doesn't work at all. Trevor tried it. He says, what I proved is I, you know, I should never have tried to reinvent the friction shock. But this is a modern, uh, this is what one looks like in case anybody's never seen one because uh, it's not likely you'll ever see another one. 
uh, here, the, here are the um, various uh, pieces they put together to make it look like this. And uh, at the back, that we're, now we're coming to the suspension pods. Um, this is the mid-Ohio car. It's the rear suspension. Here are the triple springs uh, on one rear suspension. And right across the center of the car uh, is the other pod with, with the other three operated by a rocker. Now, the Jim Meterer went to mid-Ohio with his second car, and he worked out a way to mount hydraulic shocks at the rear of the car. Uh, it involved this new wing mounting he made. There was enough room, therefore, to put this large Coney shock uh, up above everything. Again, not terribly aerodynamic, but you do what you can to get the car to the start one. Um, Going back, the, again, this is, uh, going back to the spring pods. These are die springs. I had to look up what that meant. Trevor had to explain it to me, but probably you engineer guys know that die springs are used in the body stamping industry and probably other things to separate the stamping dies. After they've squashed the metal into shape, then they, they get stuck and they have to be forced apart. And that's what these die springs do. If, if I'm wrong, somebody please jump in and correct me. But the Trevor loves them because they're cheap, they're readily available, they come in various color coded strengths. Uh, they're small. You can put three of them together and, and that stacks the weight up so that it will support the weight of his car. Uh, if, if you want to change spring rates, you just pull these out and put in more different springs. Uh, he thought they were slick. And I have no, personally, I have no reason to think they weren't a good idea, but I don't know if anybody else has ever done them. Uh, this is this is a, a picture of Trevor holding one of these pods uh, with these uh, th this trio of springs, and they would just carry you know modules of the um, you know exchange sets with them to the racetrack. Uh, how did all this fit together? Trevor shows us in this video showing the original uh, chassis tub here. This is his front suspension module, which he is very, very proud of. He, again, thinks he invented something here, which he'd never seen before. And as far as he's seen, he's never seen it since. This complete module, which contains the two suspension arms, the spring modules, the friction shocks, and of course, the you know, extraordinarily oddly shaped uh, front spindle with the, uh, the, the tiny disc brake and the big wheel on it all mounted to the chassis with a total of four bolts, two in the front and two in the back. And that's what Trevor is illustrating here. Um, another issue at the rear of the car was, the, uh, was the, uh, the fact that the rear tires were so small, the gearbox uh, wasn't capable of letting the tiny tires spin fast enough to get down the straight. The smaller the wheel, the faster they have to rotate, obviously, particularly Trevor was still hoping for upwards of 250 miles an hour, which meant he had to have really fast, rapidly spinning rear wheels. But Hewlin, their transmission manufacturer, didn't make gearing that would do that. So they cobbled together, they hot rodded gear wheels themselves that would work. This is actually a pair of Hewlin gears uh, separated. This is the inner half of one and the outer half of another. And by welding them together, he ended up with the gear ratio he needed. This is larger in diameter than the normal final drive ratio in the gearbox would be. It's actually a, a uh, from another part of the transmission, but they re-engineered it to fit the, the space they needed. Uh, th again, the, this is why it took them a year to get this car so that it could run and it was never competitive. This is a modern picture showing the, one of the cars going together uh, in restoration and readiness for the shadow tripping that happened at Road America last July. Uh, this shows the chassis tub, the uh, conventional steering wheel, the struts um, holding the, uh, uh, you know, bracing the chassis. This is the big block engine with the, this is actually now at, for, at last they have a, a, a iron an aluminum block engine because the you know, the, the, the owner of it today can, you know, snap one up easily. Uh, so it shows the tall induction stacks. It shows the tall uh, uh, exhaust header system. It shows the space for the fuel box here, the fuel. There were Firestone fuel cells, of course. 
uh, and this is the rear suspension module, which just came off the car. I mean, it couldn't unbolt from the car here. And then to the back of it, uh, on the other car, which has the low line engine in it, the, the, the radiator module stuck out the back. This is another thing they had to do because the car was so low. The car, Trevor wanted to get the car as low to the ground as they could. And so he worked hard to, to put a small diameter flywheel on it and to make the fuel, I'm sorry, the oil pan, the engine dry sump oil pan as close to the crankshaft as he possibly could. It actually almost scraped it. He says, I don't know how much clearance there was, but it wasn't much. And he, there was no space left for the standard depression to gather oil so that it could be sucked out. But he put these uh, uh, ports here on the side of the sump and he relied on the spinning crankshaft to throw the oil toward them so that they would pick up the oil. Uh, I don't know that that ever caused a problem. He didn't seem to think so. But the, the another, an auxiliary problem he had to solve was that he put a, he needed to have a smaller diameter ring beer gear on the outside of the flywheel. And that meant that the starter motor, which normally sits on the outside of the engine block and is line, it, it's designed to line up perfectly with the standard um, flywheel. Uh, it wouldn't because it was too small. So in order to angle it in, he had to relocate the starter motor to the front of the engine and then engineer a kind of a diagonal uh, jointed shaft drive to get to the uh, drive for the starter motor. Again, wow. Here's the, here's a, here's the uh, other car. This is the orange car here to the left is the more modern configuration car. This is the original configuration car with the narrow induction stack, which uh, again, Don Nichols never threw anything away. So they had one available. And so they installed it on this reproduction. You can see the small multi-plate clutch here. The engine mounts inside these two plates. There's a very thin aluminum plate across the tail here to which the engine is mounted. There's a similar one up front. And Trevor says other designers thought it was way too flimsy and they thought I was gonna have a lot of trouble with an engine plate. But he says it never gave us any trouble at all. It was fine. Uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, I showed you that. Here's the, uh, the original snorkel engine um, ready to go into the car. It's not the original engine, but it's uh, the original snorkel intake on a modern 427 engine ready to go into the car. Uh, again, here, I guess I showed you that, sorry. Now we go back to the gearbox. Remember the rear uh, rear gear that I mentioned, uh, if I can get this thing to come up, there it is. Normally a Hewland gearbox, this is the back end of a Hewland. This is the last part of it that sticks out to the rear. The main gear cluster is in, in front of the engine plate here. This is the back cover, which contains a couple of gears and the shifting mechanism back here. This bulge that you see sticking out here is non-standard. That's where Trevor Harris had to put his large hot rodded rear gear. And so that Walt Boyd that we saw earlier with the binoculars in, hand, in his hand at the racetrack, he, uh, made, he made modifications using magnesium, welded magnesium to uh, in, in increase the bulk of the gear case here. Uh, it looked like that. This is the, the gear that he had to put in there, that Trevor had to put in there. This shows the weld, weld bead around the two original halves. Uh, this shows the, a more modern iteration of what they did recently. Again, it's, it shows the, the larger lower gear here. Uh, and I'm, I've got a diagram here to show anybody who, who hasn't personally used a Keelan gearbox, what we're talking about. The transaxle, this is a, again, this is the back of the transaxle. This is the shifter mechanism. It's, it sits behind the rear axle line and the, and the differential line. The engine input shaft comes in from the rear. The shaft goes underneath the axle line to the input shaft at the lower end. And then this back here is the top gear pair and this small lower gear rotates this upper gear 
to you know to send power forward to the ring gear but trevor needed to have a larger gear down here to spin a smaller gear up here so that's what he was doing he had to have a larger one at the bottom to spin a smaller one at the top so that's uh, what we see installed uh, here. And this, uh, I just threw this in to show, uh, those of us who hang around racetracks know what this looks like, but uh, maybe some of you guys are electric car guys. This is a standard hill and you notice it doesn't have the bulge on the side. This is the rear suspension module. Here is the front of the module. This is the input shaft from the engine. And here's the two exhaust pipes running underneath it in the original configuration. This is the suspension module filled up with all its bits and pieces. Out here we have the rear suspension upright, which is not just a cast thing you buy from McLaren and, or Eagle and stick on your car. Trevor Harris had to design it and make it. He, he welded them up out of steel because he thinks steel is still a better way to go because it's just as light, just as strong as magnesium and it's quick and easy to make compared to making castings and sending them out to a foundry. Uh, here's the rocker arm system, which runs the, in, the, uh, the three springs on the inside here. Um, <clears throat> and I'll show you something in a moment, we'll see the brake cooling fan here, but this, this disc shaped thing here is actually a cooling fan, which did not appear in the final race car, but was part of the original plan. Here are the original uh, positions of the radiators. Here are these two diagonal things in the box in the back. Oil tank across the stern and the modern recreation or modern uh, completion of the original plan is the orange air brake, which when deployed looks like this. And you guys are just about the first to ever see this photograph. This was only taken a couple of weeks ago when they finally got the recreation of the uh, original streamliner car completed with the air brakes constructed, installed, and made to function. And they took it out to, um, there's a racetrack somewhere near, uh, in Pontiac, what's it called? It's one of the club racetracks up there. And these guys are in Wixom, Michigan. It's, it's RM Motorsports, the, the Bennett boys were oh. on that. And so they took it up there and uh, this is Craig Bennett driving this car for a filming purpose around the track and deploying the air brakes. And so uh, we don't know that they would have been orange with a dollar sign on them, but why not? And the car, even though the original car was the real original car that ran was orange, as we saw it earlier, it was the same tangerine color. Uh, everybody knows the shadow as black. And so they finished this one in black. And I think it's darn striking. And I'm very delighted to be able to kind of um, blow the whistle on this and show it to you before the, uh, the, the book and the video that will discuss it are out. So. Keep it to, under your hats, guys, but more to come. Here is the, uh, okay, I, I'm sorry, this is out of sequence. This, this goes back and shows Trevor and Don with the, uh, the brake cooling fan. I made a mistake there, pardon me. Here is the front uh, brake panel uh, from the rear. This is a hydraulic, I'm sorry, it's a pneumatic system they engineered to stick it up. Again, Trevor figured that's, he never got as far as designing this method of doing it, but he figures that's how they would have done it. And so they consulted with Trevor and he agreed that that's how to do it. Uh, here is the uh, same system that was the uh, rear flapper valve. I call it a flapper valve. He calls it an adjustable vein. Again, you see, it's like a throttle body. Here's the uh, pneumatic cylinder that pivots it. it this is the open position. Uh, from another angle, you see it in the closed position. Boy, this is not that responsive, is it? Sorry, guys. I'm using a PDF thing, so it takes a bit of time to get through it. This is the same thing from the other opposite direction, and it, it shows the thing flat, closed, so the air can't go out the back. It has to, go, it has to divert laterally into it. Here again is the more detailed view of the air brake system, this is in its deployed position. These are drawer slides, like uh, 
uh, heavy duty military grade door slides. And they are actually pieces that Trevor Harris sourced back when he was a hot rider, a teenage hot rider in Seattle. He was in, a, uh, in an aircraft surplus store one day in Seattle and he saw these things. These are not the actual things, these are modern ones, but he saw ones just like it. And he just picked up a couple because he thought one day maybe he could use them. And this is how he was originally going to build this car. And so none of these original pieces orig uh, survive, but uh, he, he consulted with the RM Motorsports guys and they faithfully sourced military grade industrial strength uh, door slides to uh, uh, hold this. Uh, can, you can imagine the, the weight, the, I mean, start the, the air load on this thing at something like 200 miles an hour. So they have to be strong. Um, going back to the air cooling that we talked about earlier, this is the air duct. Here is a full-size Corvair fan. So it's got three Corvair fans on the car. It's, this is the Indianapolis model of the Hewlin gearbox, which by Indy practice is to have a external starter shaft, which the mechanics plug into the back of the engine to, to rotate the engine to start it. So it needs a shaft sticking out the back. To, so Trevor repurposed that shaft to drive a, a, uh, this fan. Uh, the other side of this, I didn't include a photograph of it. It, it shows a, uh, the fact that there's a, a, a cogged belt from the lower end of the, I'm sorry, where the shaft comes out is lower than the axis of this and the connecting the two is the cogged belt which spins that. Uh, it, <coughs> it worked great. Trevor says it blew a heck of a lot of air. It worked great, except that they just couldn't get the cog belts to live. So rather than keep breaking them and keep failing to fix them, he just gave up and they put those two intake horns on to get the car to the racetrack. This is again, a more modern photo of the original transmission. I'm sorry, original suspension. Um, these are still the Hurst Earhart discs. These are not quite the original disc. They're a more modern disc. Uh, these are the uh, original style die springs here. This is a fairly conventional anti-sway bar here, or roll bar as we call it. The, uh, this is the steering link. Hey, Pete? The, yes, go ahead. As it relates to the suspension, one of the questions that came in, how much yes. wheel travel was there, do you know? Uh, I would say there was about two and a half. I did ask Trevor that, and this was from memory, and of course it could be changed, I suppose. But he thinks it was about two and a half inches. Um, the, if anybody pays any, can see it in a better angle and, and understands geometries more than I do, but he, I've been instructed by the best. These are parallel. These upper arms, these fabricated steel pieces are 10 inches long. I know they look bigger, but they're only 10 inches long. And the bottom ones, their mates on the bottom are exactly the same length and they are in exactly the same um, pivot points. In other words, it's a perfectly parallelogram system. And obviously if the car were to roll, the chassis were to roll a degree or two, so would the tire. And because the tires were so wide, the treads had to stay flat on the ground. But Trevor says he'd figured the, tre the, the car would not roll very much at all because it was so low and the suspension travel was so short. So that's why he went ahead and specified that suspension. Uh, we are coming to the end of this presentation on this tiny tire car. These are the two cars finished and displayed at Road America. <clears throat> Incidentally, this photograph was taken on commission by uh, the, one of the former uh, team photographers of the day, Dan Boyd. He, uh, I think he was from Pennsylvania in the day. He lives near Indianapolis now. And he and uh, 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 Jim Bartell, who owns these cars and, and uh, wanted them to be there at the tribute. He hired the original shadow photographer to come and shoot the event. So it, that probably means nothing to anybody other than a journalist like me, but I think it's cool. And they, but uh, he got up on the ramp of the uh, transporter and looked down on these cars. And this is, this to the right is the car as the Trevor Harris originally meant it to be. And to the left is the car as Trevor Harris had to make it be so it would run. And then a couple of weeks later, they got them out uh, to run side by side around this uh, smaller racetrack in, in New Pontiac. Uh, and the, again, you can see now from the front angle with the air brakes retracted, how low and squat and wide at the tail the original car was. You can see the diagonal 
or the arrowhead shape it had. Uh, that sister car here, it has the same body and the same shape, but you can see the side lips that Trevor engineered in and they match the, the treatment he had at the front, which people were doing. They were building, they were putting chin spoilers on the nose lips of their cars to prevent this blowover problem. And the last actual show presentation here, although we do have more photos available upon request, this is the lineup of shadows that came to Road America in July for the shadow tribute. This was this year, 2020 is the 50th anniversary of Shadow as a mark on the racetrack. It was 2020, I'm sorry, it was 1970, 50 years ago that Shadow had its first race and did the first race of the 10 seasons that they were in racing. Uh, over here on the left, we have the two original 1970 car configurations. Next to it comes the 1971 car, a larger car, but still relatively low profile. Next comes a very conventional car, 72, which was yet again a better car. 73 is here in two iterations. One was a turbocharged car. The next one along is the first of three DN4s that we have here is a one, two, and three over here. More pictures to come. Uh, <clears throat> and these were probably the best shadow ever. In, in four years, they had gone from um, Madcap, high, incredible genius Trevor Harris with a height with no college background, but uh, a uh, incredible inventive mind and willing to try anything and spend any amount of uh, Don Nichols' money as he could. He he produced uh, wild and crazy cars, which actually, in my mind, established the Mark Shadow as something anybody remembers today. But they had, then they had a very, very brilliant and, and talented, but very conventional and very classically trained English engineer named Tony Southgate design these last generation cars. <clears throat> and the, the 74 car, the DN4 in particular, was a superb car. George Fulmer came back and drove it. Jackie Oliver raced against him. Jackie ended up winning the championship, but George still considers the DN4 car the possibly one of the best Can-Am cars ever. He's certainly the best one he ever drove. He also he won the Can-Am championship with a turbocharged Porsche in 72. And the Porsche had more horsepower, but the Shadow two years later was smaller, lighter, had more downforce, more aerodynamics, better braking, its handling was better. He said it was all run better car and he's sure he could have lapped faster and beaten the turbo Porsche if he'd been driving this car two years earlier. Of course, yeah, coulda, woulda, shoulda. And so I'm gonna end up here, except that we have more pictures available upon request. And uh, this is the new book I have, Shadow the Magnificent Machines of a Man of Mystery. It's out now. We have early copies for sale through my website. It's a $100 book, $99. It's 464 pages, and it has something like 630 photographs in it. Some are mine, but some are from some really good photographers, Pete Barrow, Rainer Schlegelmilk, Bob Tronelon, and so on. Um, and I sell them on my website along with some of my other books. Uh, here's my website here. I've got a new calendar as well. And uh, I've got photographs, lots and lots of photographs on my website. So I am now throwing the floor open to questions while I have some more water. Okay, well, actually, thanks, Pete, and we'll give you a further plug on that. Any questions we don't get to, the obvious answer is the answer is in the book. So just buy the book, and whatever we don't cover tonight is there. PeteLyons.com. I'll autograph yeah. to you personally. Because <laughs> actually, actually, that's the point, Pete. This book, when you buy it from your website, it's coming straight from Pete's house, signed to you. So yes, uh, can't do that. Barnes and Noble. It's the only but, copies with my hands on them. If that means anything to you. So we're going to shift over here to some q and I've been writing down as many of them as I could. Sure. Uh, a couple of simple ones. What was the overall height of that car? Whoa, boy. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, Dean. It's in the book. Uh, I'm <laughs> going to, well, it was knee high. I'm going to say it was like 20 inches at the front wheel, front at the front fender. I may be wrong by a couple of inches, but we're talking about that. Okay. And um, actually, let's go back to slide number three, if you can. We'll, I got a question we related to slide that. number three. Yeah. Okay. Engineers pay close attention. That's this one? So, yeah, there's a picture. He noticed the picture of uh, Bruce and uh, Denny 
Oh yeah, yeah, uh, we're over here, right, right, right. Is there a significance of that? Was that were they the target? <laughs> well, I'm sure they were. Yes, yes. This uh, Bruce and Denny, uh, Bruce McLaren started the Canem McLaren team and other teams, Formula One as well, Indianapolis. Denny Holm was his star driver. They were both New Zealanders, so they were the Kiwis, and they came into can -Am in the second year, 1967, and commenced a five-year domination of the can -Am. Not because they were necessarily cleverer or smarter or had better cars than anybody else, but they came better prepared. They were the only, I won't say only, I shouldn't say only. They were, the, they were a team that took the series seriously. They needed to win races. They were there professionally to earn money. And so they started early, they tested a lot. And so as Denny told me once, he says, we, we went down to Goodwood every week and we tested those Can-Am cars and we got all the bugs ironed out. And Pete, when we came to the track, we were ready to race. We weren't ready to test, we were ready to race. And practically everybody else who came was running late and they were still in the testing phase. So they had, the cars weren't right, they weren't uh, feeding the fuel, the brakes were imbalanced, the, the uh, Everything, you know, they, they had, they were compromised from the minute they packed up the trailer to leave for the racetrack. But it's interesting because I know if I remember looking up that one year, I think Dan Gurney DNF every race. Because it was kind of like, obviously, they were doing a lot of experimental work. And yes, a lot of in, um, didn't in finish. Teams, I'm sorry, say it again. A lot of times they just didn't finish. They were doing oh, right. crazy stuff. Yeah. Now, remember, uh, those of us, who, those of you who are youngsters, you know, less than my age, uh, and we won't go into that any further, who know modern racing, know that failures are not that common in race cars. It isn't at all uncommon to every to have every starter of a race finish the race. And if there is attrition, it's very seldom. It's, it's you know, small percentage of cars, like how do, you know, NASCAR cars will start what, 40 cars and probably 35 of them are still running at the end. It was typical to lose half the cars during a typical Can-Am race, as it was in Formula One. Uh, it's just that the cars were handmade. Uh, they were put together uh, without modern machine tools, no CAD cam, nothing, none of that stuff. Very few of them were wind tunnel tested. Uh, they, were, they, they didn't get as much track time as they could have, as they should have, most of them. Uh, they didn't have any of the onboard data acquisition systems we enjoy now, no computer analysis, no, no laying traces over each other to say, okay, well, this new front uh, shock setting is this much better than the other one, so we'll go with that. Uh, they had no radio, so the driver couldn't tell them what that was happening to the car around, at a given corner around the track. So uh, it was normal for cars to break down, let's, let's put it that way. And so to me, to, to to an old guy like me, modern racing is just stunning. These cars go flat out for 24 hours at Le Mans and at Daytona, and they will finish the race. It's incredible. A uh, question related to um, budgets. Any idea what Don Nichols was spending on any of this? Um, the figure a million dollars has come up, but I question that. But I would believe six hundred, uh, five hundred, or six hundred thousand. Uh, the reason this is um, a question is that Don, by the time we got to Don in his late eighties, he was beginning to fade mentally. Um, Trevor, that's the reason that the video that I talked about, Trevor Harris and his wife Freddie were talking with Don on the phone and they hadn't talked to him for quite a while and they were both alarmed at how much he had forgotten. Uh, Trevor said he used to be so sharp, he never forgot anything, but we were terribly afraid all his knowledge was going to uh, be lost. And so on their own, they simply went up to Salinas and spent a day with them. They hired a videographer and a sound guy to come in and they shot almost four hours of tape with him that the conversational, it wasn't in depth, but at least it's a record of Don Nichols talking with Trevor Harris about the first car they ever designed. Uh, and uh, I think it's a unique, precious resource and I'm so delighted they did it. They, it gave, anyway, the point I'm making is that by the time I got to Don, um, 
he was, he, you'd ask him the same question, like, how much money did you actually spend? Or at what point did you put the dollar sign on the car because you'd exceeded the budget? And he said, oh, well, we, after we got, after we spent a million dollars, I put the dollar sign on the car. Or we were getting close to a million, you know, 900,000 something. I, so I decided to put the dollar sign on the car. Now, a guy, originally in 1969, there was a fellow who worked with the team named Kent Telford. And after the team collapsed that first year, Kent sold a story to Road and Track, sort of an inside story of whatever happened to the shadow. And he said the budget was exceeded at the $500,000 mark. So Don Nichols in the 2000s told us it was a million. Kent Telford in the 1970s told us it was 500,000. I suppose adjusted for inflation, the uh, amount is the same. In any case, it was a heck of a lot of money. Well, I just went to the inflation calculator online. And if, it was oh, million, yeah. if it was a million dollars in 1970, that'd be $26 million. Uh, oh, well, well, okay. Well, does that, where does that compare to, let's say, the McLaren budget? Was Shadow an underfunded team or were they competitive from a budget standpoint against McLaren? Well, by the time they got racing, Nichols had spent all his money. They were losing mechanics because they couldn't pay them. They were dodging bills. They literally had to sneak out of the shop with a race car to get it to Musport because there was a sheriff at the front door seizing assets so that they, a, a bill could be paid. There, there's a long story about that, which I won't get into, but it involves subterfuge and palming off a fake car to satisfy the law while they snuck out the back with the real car. Okay. It's all in the book. Okay, great. A uh, couple other questions, yes. or a couple of tech questions. Did they consider dual tires in the rear to get over the aspect ratio? Uh, I don't think they considered that. No, the whole idea was, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever asked Trevor that. That has not actually come up. Now, the modern cars do have that. I'm going through here to see if I have a picture of it. I don't think I do. The modern cars, they cannot get Firestone to agree to make those tires again. They were terrible and there's nobody left that knows how to do it anyway. And so, uh, yeah, here, here's one you might be able to see. You can, if you see this, you can see this one actually has dually wheels on it. Okay. These are the nearest way that the team that RM Motorsports could get the car on suitable rubber. These are Hoosier tires made for formula cars, small bore formula cars. And so they put four of them on the back and the same thing at the front. These are not quite dimensionally accurate, but they get the job done. They, and they show you that the car can get around the racetrack. Another technical question on the orange car, if you can find an overhead shot. Uh, this one? Uh, They're asking about the holes um, in the front, I guess, probably right below the number. Um, the front number, there's some holes. Yeah, those, yeah, yeah, those, yeah. what are those? I'm, I'm, I, th I think they're simply driver cooling aids. Okay. They, they appeared right early on and they stayed there. And this, this panel uh, is easily removable. So they, that they would remove that to get at the you know, clutch cylinder and stuff like that, brake cylinders. Oh. Um, uh, who was, who was this, building their engines? I'm sorry, what? Who was building their engines? They had uh, the first engine they, they built was um, um, in, okay, I'll simplify it. They had a series of them. By the end of the program, uh, Al Bartz was building them and they had no more money to pay Al Bartz. So they had to leave with the engines they had. And, you know, when they started having trouble, they could not, they could not even pay Al Bartz for the engine they had, let alone bring him back east to fix, bring a new engine and, and solve their problem it wouldn't have saved their weekend any day. Anyway, let's face it. Um, so you can say that this engine was built by Al Bartz. Okay. In, in this race, it's running on seven cylinders and it's about to oh, die of overheating. The uh, other, we, the other four orifices, people are always asking, what are these two slots in the front? Are they to cool the tires? Well, in fact, we have pictures of the tire, Firestone tire engineers sticking their temperature probes in to, to check the temperature of the tire tread. But originally they were designed for these air brakes that were never actually installed. And rather than change the body 
pieces. I just left them there. The two inlets down at the front are for the for the, the brakes. They 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 have ducts that lead to the inside of the front wheels and then get expelled out. The air gets expelled out through the uh, Corvair fans. I'm curious. Prior to this, Trevor Harris was an unknown. Trevor Harris, of course, has designed some incredible cars, including the Nissan GTP cars and a bunch yes. of other wildly successful cars. But yes, why did Don Nichols hire an unknown like Trevor Harris? And it seems like a horrendously complex car for his first big uh, break. Well, this honestly, it goes back to who Don Nichols was. Don is Don. It was an entrepreneurial guy, a businessman in Japan. And he was, his main business was importing Firestone and Goodyear uh, racing tires to the Japanese industry, which was, and we're talking late fifties, early sixties. So that uh, Japanese enthusiasm was running wild and rampant, but they didn't have Western technology. They didn't actually know how to get go about getting shock absorbers, brakes, um, uh, various other parts that they needed that were made in Europe. Don Nichols knew intimately because he was always going to European Formula One races and other races buying used racing tires, which he would then bring back to Japan and sell to people in Japan. So he, he would walk into a race, uh, race paddock in Europe and he knew everybody. And uh, so that he could, uh, there, Trevor tells a story of one time Don was working with Toyota in Japan and they came to Don and said, Mr. Nichols, we need to have some shock absorbers, very, very small shock absorbers. These are the dimensions we must have. Nobody makes them. How do we get some? And Don said, oh, I can do that, but uh, it's going to cost some money. Yes, yes, Mr. Nichols, we will pay anything. We must have these. So Don, he said, Don said it was, I guess Don sold this, this story. It was August. And of course, Europe goes on vacation in August, particularly Coney, because they're in on, on the continent. But he, Don knew personally the head of Coney. So he called him up and got the workers back from vacation on super special, uh, super trick, super overtime rates to make these special shocks for Coney, for a, for a Toyota, <clears throat> sent them to Japan, the bill was paid and everybody let, made a lot of money. I don't know whether the shocks ever got used, but uh, that's, that's the position he was in. And so when he was a, uh, I'll also tell you that he was a paratrooper in World War II. He was a teenager when World War II broke out. His, uh, he got the idea that he wanted to be part of it. He, was a, he told us, quote, I was afraid the war was going to end and I would miss it. And so he says, I, I, enlist, I left high school without graduating. And I might have been a little underage, but they took me. So we think he was 17 when he joined the army and they put, they, he wanted to be a paratrooper. They made him an elite paratrooper of something called the Pathfinders, which were the guys who parachuted out of the airplane early on D-Day before dawn, you know, like a plane load of like 10 of them, various plots around Normandy. Their idea was to, par their mission was to parachute into pitch blackness into enemy territory and set up some signaling devices <laughs> so that the oncoming wave of uh, troop carrying planes could know where to drop the troopers. This hazardous duty, man, this, this man's feet were among the very first American boots on the ground at D-Day. And I think we ought to remember that about him. A lot of people don't remember Don Nichols fondly for his various business uh, uh, practices, but w I think we should not forget that, that about him. And That's anyway, the, the, to answer your question, you see why I need a long book to write these things down? Yeah. Don gonna... and Trevor were exactly the same kind of people. They hit it off instantly. Trevor is a wild, a conceptual guy. He'll try anything. He's always looking to try something nobody else ever has done before. He says his joy in engineering is to think of something no one else has ever thought of and to make it work. And Don Nichols is exactly the same kind of guy. Don is Don often used to say that, you know, I could have bought a McLaren or a Lola and gone racing with a conventional car. What's the point of that? You're not going to win against the factory cars. They've always got the next model, which is faster. And uh, if, you, if you do happen to win, it's not because you're faster. It's just that you, you lasted through the race and they didn't. 
Whereas if you try something new and crazy, you may fall on your face. You may waste your, all your time and your money. But if you succeed, you get all the credit for it. Yeah. Well, they had uh, retired wealthy from Japan, and it, this was a hobby to him. So okay. it's not that he was a he made a silly decision to do all these new things, and Trevor did not have to convince him. All Trevor had to do was show him his basic idea, and Don climbed on board instantly. A couple more quick questions. We'll wrap up. Uh, yeah. What about the UOP money? How the UOP connection come about? That happened uh, to uh, uh, Kent Telford made that happen. The the uh, the young man who wrote the uh, the tell all story. Uh, Don Nichols was able to get a little more money back, and he uh, he needed a sponsor though because he had very little, uh, not enough money to continue. So he has brought Kent Telford back and gave him the, he said, I gave him the Fortune 500 directory, you know, 500 companies. And he says, call every one of them cold and see if they'll sponsor a race car. And uh, uh, Kent says, he said, Kent said, well, I'll start at the front, right? He says, well, yeah, it's logical. They start with A and go to Z. If you have to go to Z. And so, Kent started with A and he went through every company named A, B, C, D. And finally, one day he got to you. And a guy at <clears throat> UOP in Des Plaines, Illinois, picked up the phone and, and Kent made his sales pitch to sponsor this American racing card that was uh, going to you know, take on the world. And the guy was uh, Ben uh, Williams, who was the PR guy for uh, UOP. We think that's the case. And he said, yeah, let me take this to my boss. We might be interested. And that was when UOP, which means universal oil products. Uh, you know, I'm not actually sure what it's called. Uni universal oil products company. Yes, that's what it says. <clears throat> uh, UOP was in the business of cracking fuels, uh, crude oil into various fuels, as well as other products that you get out of crude oil. And so their expertise was developing fuel uh, refineries. They didn't sell fuel to the public. There was no reason for the public to know that UOP ever existed. But the, that was the time in the early 70s when uh, there was this big push on to get lead out of gasoline. And UOP had developed a catalytic process to create lead-free fuel. And so what a better idea to get the word out to the world that they could do this than to balance, emblazon their name on a race car to show, to prove that a car burning lead-free fuel was just as good, if not better, it could make as, more, as much power and was reliable as a conventional car burning conventional fuel. Remember, there was a lot of uh, uh, resistance in the industry and in the public to lead-free fuel. There's all these wives' tales about it's going to burn your valves, it's going to damage your engine, it's going to be terrible, it's follow your spark plugs. And so they said the best way to prove it won't do any of that is to build a race car and people can see it out on the track and listen to it and they know it isn't hurting the engine. Cool. Uh, Jerry Lou corrected me. I guess I went to the wrong inflation calculator. <laughs> $1 million in 1970 is about 6.7 million in today's dollars. So not quite uh, the astronomical amount, but still. My God, I've just bought my jet. Dean, <laughs> you owe me big. Uh, question from Don Taylor. Uh, he notes that hey, um, Don. Uh, Peter Bryant, <coughs> he was the between after uh, Trevor Harrison before Tony Southgate. Any, any fun quick story on uh, Peter Bryant? Um. Peter Bryant and the UOP fuel. Peter tells this story in his own book, Can-Am Challenger, which I recommend to anybody. It's fun. It's a fun read. It was a very rollicking English guy, nothing like Tony Southgate. He was not university trained, but he was a racing mechanic with, with big dreams and ambitions. And he worked with Don Nichols to build the, uh, the first of the UOP cars. That's uh, this one. This is the 1971 car sort of a halfway step between the tiny tire and the conventional one that was this car. And when they were doing, uh, when they, the um, SCCA said, well, if you're going to use the, the fuel that we, if you're going to use fuel other than the one that we uh, 
supply at the racetrack, you can do that, but you have to submit a sample of it so we can prove it's what you say it is. And so Peter took a sample of the fuel that he, he UOP had to blend this fuel special at some phenomenal cost, which Dean will recalculate for us, but it had to go, uh, it had to be made special and shipped in 55 gallon drums to every racetrack, including all the way to places like South Africa and Japan. And, uh, but, the, but it came in big 55 gallon drums. So uh, um, P Peter Bryant had to supply John Tamanis of the SCCA a sample of this for testing. So they took it to, uh, he, he, he took a bottle, he grabbed a bottle, which happened to be Gatorade and, and he emptied the Gatorade out and he put you know, some gasoline in it, which happened to be tinted green. That's the way uh, UOP uh, marked its fuel as being lead free, it was tinted green. And he put, took it to the uh, SCCA office at, at Road America and he put it on the table for John Tamanis to take away and getting testing. But, and even, he even put a label on it saying, do not drink this, this is poison. But somebody came, John Tamanis came in the motorhome at that point, sweating and hot, sweltering hot day, saw this green Gatorade in this jar and before anybody could stop him, he picked it up and took a swig of it. And Peter says he nearly fell on the floor laughing because <laughs> this look came over John's face and he spewed out the stuff. It went all over, everybody was sitting at a little dinette table. Somebody was smoking, it caught the fuel on fire. He says, I fell on my floor laughing. <laughs> ah, the KM used to be fun, guys. Yeah. Um, got a question. How did the cable shifter work? Did it work well Poor, or? No, poorly. Okay. No, then, nobody liked it. It was miserable. Okay. Yeah, yeah missed gears, uh, sloppiness, hard to maintain. Uh, it just uh, was not a success. I don't know. We've got a. I don't know. We've got a good picture of it here, but we. It's. You're right. We're running a little bit over time, so I'm going to wrap up with this last one. What other engines? Uh, it was a 427 in the first car. Were they always 427 throughout the history of the uh, Shadow Can Am cars, or did they? No, only the first year. Um, the McLaren team and some of the other well-funded uh, teams were already using aluminum block Chevy engines which were considerably more expensive. You know, there were options in Corvettes. I mean, they were mass produced, but they yeah. were more expensive than a lot of teams liked saving 150 pounds of weight. So they, uh, they went with those, but uh, you know, Nichols was literally out of money at that point. And so all they could afford was standard everyday iron block engines, which weighed, as I said, 150 pounds more than the, iron, than the other blocks. So that's all they had that first year. However, Subsequently, they did have the funding, especially when UOP came aboard to, to build the proper engines, which got as big as, I guess, 510 cubic inches at some point. Oh. They were making, uh, I, I actually am in the middle of doing a, an interview with a UOP fuel blender who lives out here in California now, and he's all excited about telling his story. And he says, they, we got as much as 780 horsepower out of the last engines, the, the 1974 engines. And that's, that's more than they ever told anybody at the time. The number I was given in 1974 from the guys who were building the engines was that it was all oh, about 735 feet. And he says, oh yeah, hey, well, we, were, we were up to 780. Oh. Well, I don't wanna keep you out too late here. I'd like to bring this to a close. If you'd stop sharing your screen and well, Delbert. Stop sharing, okay, how do I do that? Stop yeah. here, okay. Okay, and so uh, Delbert, if you wanna take yourself off of mute, but um, we can't do a virtual round of applause, but I would just encourage everyone to go to PeteLyons.com and uh, take a look at what he's got to offer. His books are fabulous. Uh, compared to some of the SA technical publications, $100 is a bargain. And it's one that you're gonna wanna read some fun stories in there. Uh, so I highly recommend it. But so thank you very much, Pete, for taking time out of your schedule. Thank you, guys. To share the stories. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to close. Uh, Delbert Boone can talk about upcoming things and how you can get involved. Okay. Great job, Pete. Thank you. Just as a reminder to those out there, uh, we have two upcoming events over the next few weeks. 
Uh, the first will be September 30th, which will be an electric vehicle event in, in lieu of National Electric Drive Week. And we also have an event on October 7th, which is a career seminar uh, in conjunction with uh, the Society of Women Engineers, SHIP, and NSBE. Uh, for those looking to become active or wanting more information about the Southern California section, uh, we have a website, which is listed here under our web link, uh, saesocal.org. We also have uh, social media links on LinkedIn, Facebook. We have a YouTube channel, which we would like folks to subscribe to. Uh, and last but not least, uh, if you want more information or have any further questions, Dean can be reached at memberships, excuse me, membership, uh, non-plural at saesocal.org or myself, can, I can be reached at meetings.tours at saesocal.org. So hopefully everyone enjoyed the webinar and thank you and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again.